Welcome back to BetterHelp's In Session series. I'm Hesu Jo, a licensed marriage and family therapist and part of the clinical operations team here at BetterHelp. October is Depression Awareness Month, and this month we are diving into this topic with fellow BetterHelp therapist, Dr. Jonathan Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a licensed marriage and family therapist from Dallas, Texas, who earned a master's in human development and family science and a PhD in medical family therapy. He spent six years teaching graduate courses in marriage and family therapy and has provided individual and relationship counseling in both inpatient and outpatient settings. He's a published author on various topics, including attachment, intimacy and relationships, and family therapy, and he has ongoing research interests in the area of intimate partner violence, family systems, attachment theory, and integrating medical and behavioral health care. At BetterHelp, Dr. Wilson leads popular group webinars on topics related to depression, anxiety, and relationships. And if you don't know what group webinars are, these are educational webinar type of um, opportunities that are offered to BetterHelp members. So if you ever want to check these out, um, you can find them as a BetterHelp member. If you're curious about them, you can always email us and, and ask some questions about what those are. Um, he's also one of our therapist ambassadors on BetterHelp's TikTok, where he provides bite-sized tips and tricks related to mental health. So Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for coming on and joining us with our in-session series this month. Before we dive into this topic, um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about you, about why you decided to became a, become a therapist and what you still enjoy about it now. Well, thank you so much for having me, Hey Sue. I'm, I'm honored to be here and uh, what, what a great time to be talking about these topics with it being uh, Depression Awareness Month uh, for October. I I think part of me always wanted to be a therapist I, as, as long as I can remember even you know in junior high and high school I think I always wanted to work in mental health for a, a stage there I thought I wanted to go more the medical route towards the psychiatry type uh, type setting but um, I, I I think I really at my core I wanted to be the one in the room doing the work with clients. And uh, I felt like that becoming a licensed therapist was going to give me more of that feel more so than the medical side of things would. And so I think that's what ultimately led me to choose this path. Um, I've always had an interest in helping in helping people uh, with relationship issues. Um, you know, so I work a lot with couples, with individuals um, on family and relationship issues. Um, in fact, the groups that I lead as well, in addition to the group in ours, are focused on on stress and anxiety and relationships. But I, um, but yeah, I've, I've always I've always found just a lot of satisfaction, and I consider it a privilege to get to meet with people. Um, and often what are some of the darkest places of their lives? And I get to be, uh, I get to be the one to get to help walk them through that. And I get to be the one to witness some of the changes that they, that they make. So it's, it's very, it's an exciting uh, career and it's certainly a privilege to get to be a part of. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and letting us into some of your reasoning behind it. It resonates with me. I'm sure it resonates with a lot of other therapists too. You have a heart of helping. It sounds like you know, you're thinking about building relationships with the people where physicians can do that, but you know, you may be seeing your patients once a year at most. So, yeah. um, when things are good, of course. So, right. um, and just jump, jumping into this topic here, you know, when, when a lot of us hear about depression, we visualize, we think of something that's presented as super sad people being just low. Why are you so blue? Like that kind of stuff. Mm. However, there are a lot of different symptoms of depression some that are less obvious than others. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. This is a great question. And 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 you and you highlighted I think a key distinction between the the common emotion of sadness, which is something that I think everybody experiences. That in fact I would say sadness is a normal part of the human experience. Everyone is going to feel sad from time to time. And that's not necessarily problematic. I've had people who ask me, uh, you know, how do I just not ever feel sad again? And to that, I would say, I don't think that that's a realistic goal because I think our emotions, they all serve a purpose, including sadness, depression, uh, especially clinical depression. It goes a much further above and beyond the common uh, experience of sadness. Um, what we see is a much higher level of psychological and emotional pain um, that that comes along with depression, so much so that it does involve an element of um, of 
oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it hinders a person's ability to function properly. Um, so when a person is going through depression, they're typically not able to go about their day-to-day -day lives and function normally in the way that they are used to. Um, and so it's common for people to be physically, emotionally, psychologically unable to go to work, to take care of their families, their children, even themselves. Uh, and so there is a there is a a marked difference in their ability to function um, for the person who is going through depression versus their normal self when they're not in the middle of that depressed state. Yeah, really, it's an impairment. It it um, like you said, it hinders somebody's ability to just move through their life. Where a lot of times when we're feeling emotional, it can be challenging to take care of life's everyday needs. But more than often, we're still able to kind of power through and do it. Um, Absolutely. And, you, and depression, you, you know, it, it can present in a number of ways. And I think that's one of the things that makes depression so challenging uh, for people to go through. It can be so frustrating to go through. And, and frankly, as a therapist, it's one of the things that can make depression so difficult to treat. Uh, because uh, when we look at the, the various symptoms that go into depression, you only have to have five symptoms uh, out of, I think, nine or ten uh, for a period of two weeks or so to qualify as a depressive episode. Well, you do the math. I mean, if you only have to have five symptoms, you could have, uh, you know, countless numbers of, uh, of different combinations of symptoms that could constitute a depressive episode. And the, every single one of those episodes could look differently. Um, and so, the you know, the way that I would uh, approach treatment with someone whose depression was characterized by, you know, insomnia and um, a lack of interest in things that they once enjoyed, you know, when they weren't depressed, it's going to look differently than someone who, whose uh, depression is characterized by uh, by rest uh, or by um, maybe appetite changes um, and um, thoughts of suicide. You know, that's going to that, that's going to look different. Um, there will be some similar aspects of it, but um, there's a lot of variability in the ways that it can present. And that's why I think treatment is so is so important, because your, your therapist is going to be able to help walk you through the unique aspects of that process. Yeah. And your therapist will also help educate you because you might be going through it and experiencing depression, not realizing because it's not necessarily feeling sad all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. There's like you, you talked about some of these things, losing interest in things that used to spark some excitement for you or changes in your sleep, changes in your eating, you know, in teens, we see irritability and this different kind of frustration that comes. Um, and depression really manifests in a lot of people very differently. So are there any kind of uncommon symptoms of depression that people aren't really talking about as much? Like we all know the image of somebody that has less motivation to do anything, but anything else that people can be thinking about? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, the, the, the two, I think that, that really stand out to me that, that can really go either way, which is interesting is um, some people, some people sleep much less than they normally would. When they're depressed, some people sleep excessively more than they normally would. Um, some people eat much less than they normally would when they're depressed. Some people eat much more than they normally would when they're depressed. So, I mean, and so when we think about those two really key aspects of our lives, which eating and sleeping are are central to you know to all of our daily functioning, um, it's not always a person is 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 in bed all the time and they are just eating junk food when they're depressed. It could be that they can't sleep. And that they have no appetite, mm -hmm. um, and so it, I think it's important to dispel any like stereotypical ideas that uh, that depression always has to look this one certain way. Absolutely, and you know when somebody is depressed, when we've even experienced it, it's probably noticeable for other people because you're talking about like big mm -hmm. shifts in our behavior changes in the ways that we're presenting. So when we're struggling with depression, sometimes people around us are really unsure of how to respond to that. And sometimes they may say things that are attempting to be helpful, things like, you know, snap out of it, or you don't really have any reasons to be sad, or it's probably all just in your head. And, you mm -hmm. know, no matter how good somebody else's intentions are, why might these statements be harmful and unhelpful to say to someone who's depressed? And in addition to that, what can we be saying instead to try to support our loved ones? It's a great question. And, and I think that when people say things like that, most of the time they mean well. You know, most of the time they mean well. I think they simply just don't know how to help. And so if they can, in a, in a sense, kind of convince themselves that, look, this really is just a matter of willpower or it's just a mindset that this person is in. 
And, and, you know, and if they just maybe change their mindset a little bit, they can snap out of this depression. Well, then the person giving these comments can then absolve themselves of any responsibility or any, or any obligation to help. Um, and so I think that they mean well, but they're misinformed. The reality is, look, when we look at when we look at the brains of people, if, if we could do if we could do a brain scan of everyone who has major repressive disorder, for instance, I know that's not feasible, but if we could and compare it to the brains of people who aren't living with this condition, we could see literal anatomical differences, structural differences in the way that certain brain structures function, like the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. We could see differences in the way that those areas of the brain are, are structured. And so what does that tell us? It, it tells us that depression is a medical condition. Uh, it is a, it is a medical condition in the same way uh, I, I compare, you know, to diabetes for instance, right? And these are two very, very different conditions, but people living with diabetes are living with a pancreas that's not regulating their insulin or producing insulin in the way they need it to. People living with depression are living with certain brain structures that aren't regulating their neurotransmitter activity among other things in the way they need it to. And so we're not doing ourselves any favors when we say, Oh, you know, just cheer up or, uh, you know, just snap out of it or just go for just a make walk. more insulin. Right. Nope. Exactly. You, you would <laughs> never say something like that to someone with diabetes. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. so why would we say it to someone with depression? Um, and so what's, what's more helpful is to just say, I, I, I may not understand everything that you're going through, but I want to, and I'm here for you and I love you. Um, you know, to, to know that it's okay to not have all the answers. Look, when people are going through depression, they don't have all the answers. Um, that's part of why they're struggling is because they don't have the answers. They don't need you to have all the answers. They just need to know that you're there for them, uh, that you empathize with them, that you care about them and that you want to be helpful. Um, you know, and so if you're conveying that empathy and just saying, look, I'm here for you, I don't I don't have all the answers, but uh, I'm here for you. And I know that uh, I know that you're going to come through this thing that that's going to make a huge difference. It's powerful. I, you're just giving an example. But when you are sharing examples of what you could say, I felt warm tinglies. I felt like, oh, mm-hmm. he's here for me. He he doesn't he's not trying to, like, fix me or change the situation mm-hmm. because I know that he can't. But just your presence sounds like it's, that's what we can do to support our loved ones. Um, and, and, you know, for those loved ones, or sometimes ourselves, sometimes it can feel really, really hopeless um, when we're struggling with depression. So, you know, this is a big, broad question, but will it get better? What are some proven ways to treat depression? And the reason we ask this is to, to give some information to those that might be feeling this way right now. Well, you know, hey, Sue, I think that um, I, I, I think one of the most encouraging things about uh, about being a therapist that that treats depression uh, in my clients mm-hmm. is research shows us that 85% of people with depression do eventually recover. And that includes people that don't seek treatment. So when we when we're talking about people that are actively meeting with their therapist or taking medication or things like that, those those odds of recovery are even higher. So anyone who's watching that that may be going through a season of depression right now, know that the odds are on your side that you are going to eventually recover. Um, and no, I, de- that the, the battle against depression isn't won overnight. Uh, it's not something you're not just going to wake up tomorrow and your depression is going to be gone in the same way your depression didn't form overnight. Um, you know, I like to compare a, an analogy, a metaphor, you know, that I like to compare depression to is that of a hurricane. I, I, I grew, I'm, I'm a Texas boy. I grew up on the South coast, uh, Southeast Texas coast. Um, so I've lived through a number of hurricanes in my lifetime. Um, hurricanes are slow to form, you know, they're not, it's, uh, they're not a storm that just pops up overnight. They're slow to form and they're fed by factors, you know, and I'm not a meteorologist, so forgive if I, if I'm inaccurate in any of this, but they're fed by factors like warm ocean water, low pressure atmospheric conditions and so on. Depression in a lot of ways, like a hurricane, it's fed by things like hopelessness and guilt and and fear and uh, sadness. I mean, all, all the uh, in, uh, uh, limited activity, all these different things that just kind of feed into the cycle of depression and churn and just make the storm stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, one of the lies that depression tells us is that if you don't have 100% of yourself to give, that you might as well not give anything at all. And 
And it, it's it's completely false. I mean, because of course, when you're depressed, you're not going to have the same amount of capacity to kind of just to work on self-improvement and self-care and all those things that we want to do that are good for ourselves. You're not going to have the same capacity to do everything. What depression wants is for you to say, you know what, since I can't do all of those things, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to I'm just going to, you know, call it a call it a day. I'm just going to stay in bed and not do anything for myself all day. To, to answer your question, will it get better? One of the ways that you can intentionally make progress towards making it better, even if you only have 5% of yourself to give, is to give whatever you have to offer that day towards taking back a little bit of that power and a little bit of that control that depression has stolen from you. Uh, for some people, it might be getting out of bed and taking a shower that day. And you know what? Look, I tell people, look, if that's the 5% that you have to give, then take the best shower that you've had in weeks. You know, get like get a fresh towel, maybe throw it in the dryer before you get in the shower. Use the best soap, you know, that you have. Actually, there's some research that says a cold shower can actually be really good for depression because it can kind of be activating. So maybe there's some there's some value there, too. But but the point is, look, your depression, even if it's just that shower, your depression doesn't want you to get out of bed and take that shower. Because doing so is you kind of reaching up and saying, you know what? I know that I'm going to still have depression at the end of today, but guess what? I'm taking back a little bit of that power that you've stolen from me today. And tomorrow, that 5% might be getting out of bed, going for a, a five or 10 minute walk outside, uh, you know, and getting getting some fresh air. Uh, or it might be uh, having a phone or, or a video chat with your with your better health therapist um, or attending a group in R or a support group um, or having coffee with a friend or family member. Um, you know, those little things, no one of them by themselves are going to are, are going to be the the thing that ultimately you know rids you or cures you of depression. I put in quotation marks because I don't know that there is a cure, but but each of those things in combination with one another, when you when your mindset each day is how can I take back a little bit of that power and control that depression has stolen from me? And you do that and you make that commitment day after day, even if it's just piece by piece, you will eventually beat this thing. And I think that's the that's the real important thing to know. Yeah, you're describing something that a lot of therapists refer to as behavioral activation. So if you're out there mm -hmm. listening to this, feeling very hopeless, there is some stuff that you can start learning with a therapist if that's something that you're interested in checking out. Um, you've already answered my next question a bit, but I do want to see if there's anything else there about any additional immediate coping skills you could share with folks that are listening in now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in, in terms of coping skills, uh, people, people ask me a lot, like, how, you know, how do I cope with depression? Like, what are, you know, what are, what are some things that I can do to just uh, to make depression feel less uh, like all encompassing overbearing? And a lot of times what people are asking is what, what can I do when my depression is like a 10 out of 10, when it's on my very worst days, what are the things I can do? Um, and I think that's a valid question. But what I would say is uh, a starting place for that is uh, to ask yourself, what are the things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, what are the things that you're doing uh, for your regular routine self-care? You'd be surprised. Look, our culture, we are so busy. Uh, I know I am too. I mean, uh, so many of us, we have so many responsibilities at work and at home and with our families. And finding time for ourselves to care for ourselves can seem like an impossible task at times. Um, and so we just, we wear ourselves out and, and then it's, it's no wonder that it makes it even harder to cope with depression when we're really not doing anything for ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, so I always have a conversation about self-care with my clients. Uh, and when we talk about self-care, um, I use a term called biopsychosocial spiritual care. Uh, and the idea here is that each of us have these four components to ourselves, our biological selves, our psychological selves, our social selves, and our spiritual selves. And by spiritual, I don't necessarily mean religious. For some people, that might involve religiosity. For many people, it doesn't. Um, so this isn't about you know organized religion or not. But regardless, I would say we all have a need for spiritual self-care. Um, and the reality is, if one of those areas is suffering, the others are going to suffer. I mean, if you think back to just if you have a cold, right, a common cold, you're not, you're, that's really a physical condition, but you're not going to be feeling your best psychologically, socially, and spiritually in that moment either. Um, in the same way, we have to spend time caring for ourselves in each of these areas too, even if it's in very small increments. 
Um, something I do every single day. Uh, I, I have, um, I have one of the, uh, there are plenty of meditation apps out there. I use an app that puts out a daily 10 minute meditation, um, uh, every single day. In a lot of ways, Hey Sue, that's one of the best 10 minutes of my day. Uh, you know, because it really, I, I'm not, I'm not an overly religious guy, but, uh, that really just that 10 minute meditation each day, it helps me to set my intention and my focus for the day. And you would be surprised at how much of a difference I can tell on the days that I choose not to do that meditation compared to the days that I choose to do it. Even that's that, that, that 10 minutes. And yeah, that's 10 minutes that I could spend with work or with household tasks or other things. So it's not that I don't have other things I could be doing, but I find that the quality of my day is so much better uh, when I do those things. And so attending to your daily self-care is so, so, so important. Um, but then I think it's also really important to have a strategy for the days that are really hard. Um, and one way to do that, I think, is to have intentional conversations with your therapist when you're thinking back to, okay, what on those days when I, when my depression was a 10 out of 10, if I could go back and talk to myself and say, hey, you know, uh, you know, it's going to be okay. What, what messages would I like myself to remember on those days? Um, you know, what are the things that as, I, as I'm thinking back, what would be most helpful on those days? For some people, it might have been, you know what, it would have been really great if, you know, if I had my partner there to just kind of comfort me, or if I had a friend or family member that could call, uh, that I could call and talk to, or um, it might be really helpful if I, um, uh, you know, if I was able to just take a little time off of work, just to just to rest, you know, so many times when we're depressed, like our bodies, we just need rest. Um, but the needs of every single person are different. And so I think having those intentional self-reflecting conversations um, with your, with your partner, with your, uh, with your therapist, with your friends or family, I think that's really important and involve those people in that process too, because depression thrives when you're isolated. And so, um, you know, it, I, if there's someone in your life that you can say, Hey, um, as I'm kind of working through this, I know that there are going to be days when I'm really struggling. Would it be okay with you on those days? Like if I reach out to you and just say, Hey, I, I could just really use a, a friend um, or just really use a, some encouragement today. Um, and, and that, that can really go a long way too. to just have someone to let you know that you're not doing this alone. Yeah. I, I love all these tips um, and skills. And a lot of it comes back to taking power back in your life, taking ownership over your own healing um, sharing a personal anecdote, like the daily thing of doing something, this behavioral activation for me, it started a, very recently, actually, I didn't used to floss my teeth every day, folks, but mm -hmm. this is something that I challenged myself to start my day with. Um, so actually it made such a huge difference, this mm -hmm. small thing. Um, uh, but it, 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 it's, it, came back to me realizing like, oh, as a therapist, I'm preaching self-care to my clients all the time and reminding them self-care isn't necessarily about overindulgence. It's about sometimes doing something that you don't necessarily want to because it's good for you. And that is how I felt about flossing for like 30 some odd years. <laughs> uh, but now, you know, when I do it, it doesn't take too long, but after I've done it, it's like, I already set my day, started my day with self-care, doing something that I didn't necessarily yeah. want to, but it's activating. So for me, that's what mm -hmm. it was for you. You might have to figure what that out that is, right? So it's like mm -hmm. a lot of trial and error, a lot of exploration, getting to know yourself, which you can do in therapy. Um, I do have a final question and then want to leave it open for anything else that you want to share. Do you have any additional messages of hope for those out there who may feel like it's not getting any better? And then any other thoughts that you'd like to continue to share with our viewers here on depression? Absolutely. Uh, look, depression wants you to believe that there's no reason to be hopeful. Depression wants you to believe that things are never going to get better. That your worst day is now going to be your reality. And that this pain that you're feeling is now your norm. And uh, you know, as a therapist, I've been a therapist for 15 years and, uh, you know, and I've seen people in some of the worst circumstances of their life. And I can, I can unequivocally tell you that, that those are bold faced lies. Um, and the moment that you can recognize and you can acknowledge that, that, uh, your depression is fleeting, um, it's not going to be here forever and it's not going to call the shots in your life if you choose not to let it is the moment that the tide is going to begin to, to turn in your favor. 
Um, and you're just remember, there are so many resources out there. There are people that care about you and there are so many outlets and resources that you can reach out to. Your therapist at BetterHelp being the first, you know, being being just one of those resources. But um, like if you're struggling, there is no weakness uh, in reaching out for help. In fact, I would say that reaching out for help is a sign of, uh, is, a, is a tremendous sign of personal maturity and even strength. Because, you know, we live, unfortunately, we live in a culture that often tells us that um, that to reach out for help is to, to show weakness. And I would say it's quite the opposite. I would say to, to reach out for help when we need it is a sign that, you know, I respect myself, I value myself, and, and, and I'm not going to allow something like depression to call the shots in my life. And, and so don't be, don't be ashamed. Uh, I, look, I, I, I've done this for a living for 15 years. I've also gone through depression myself, uh, you know, so, and, and I've, I've, so I've been through it, uh, been through it myself. So if, if anybody should just be able to, you know, snap out of it, it should be the therapist. <laughs> uh, and this was like, since this is since I've been licensed as a therapist, you know? And so, uh, if, 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 if I'm willing, and I would go to treatment again, if I ever needed it, I, I certainly would uh, without hesitation. Um, and so I would, I would encourage everyone to just, uh, to keep that in mind too, that there's no shame, there's no weakness, um, in being willing to reach out for help. Um, I would also say, by the way, too, I know there's a lot of stigma about, about medication and, and, uh, but that's also a conversation that's worth having with your doctor too. Um, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of people, uh, I, I hear that from my clients all the time too, when they talk about, well, I, I you know, I don't want to. Um, you know, I don't want to take medication because I view that as a sign of weakness. So I'm not a medical doctor. I, could, I certainly couldn't tell you whether you need medication or not, but there's no harm in, in, in keeping that option open to you and being willing to have that conversation with, uh, with your physician uh, and, and establishing and maintaining a relationship with a physician that, that knows you and knows your medical history and that you trust and that you can express concerns or questions to. That can also be a critical piece of your journey as well. Right. Thank you for bringing up the medication piece, because I was actually thinking like, oh, I got to ask him that before we disconnect. So I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. Um, and, and going back to your analogy you used with uh, diabetes, you know, folks with living with chronic illness, similarly, it can get better. It will get better, but you do have to put in some effort. If you allow yourself to be untreated, sometimes it doesn't get better. And that is the reality. So it's taking ownership. Mm -hmm. It's reaching out for support remembering that you don't need to do this alone um, and that there are so many people out there that want to help you. So thank you so much, Dr. Wilson, for your time, your positive energy and your expertise and wisdom. Um, we'll have some information in the comments below and um, yes, thanks again. Oh, my pleasure. Hey, Sue, thank you for having me.